Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, meditative movements, breakers and tenon bounce. Is it possible for us to redraw our inner maps to embody a sense of trust and confidence in the future? Covid got you down? Ekin Bernay wants to help calm your mind. Then, an Afghan girl goes for breakdancer glory despite the threats of war. They're all living together under the same roof, in harmony. I love you more than anything. And we revisit the Royal Tenenbaums 20 years after its release. Health studies show COVID-19 is making people more anxious and stressed. But performance artist Ekin Bernay believes she can make you feel better by exploring stillness, movement and breath. Her latest project, run by the Tate Modern, is called Resilient Responses, Repair and Restore. Bernay wants to help people discover their physical limits and resistance. As an artist who is also a dance and movement psychotherapist, she uses text, sound and choreography to direct her audience. And Ekim Bernay joins me now. Hi there, it's good to have you with us today. So, uh, tell us why this performance in particular is important, especially during COVID-19. I think, first of all, it was a very interesting experience to film in a lockdown Tate Modern. The building was empty and we were taking over the building with our bodies. I kind of felt a responsibility towards the people that actually express themselves through their movement and their bodies. So that's one of it, that I really felt that I was holding a lot of weight for the artists out there who are not able to express because of all the change that's been happening in the world. And also, I think the response, we were all thinking about isolation and um, with Thomas Hayes and Rowdy SS. Um, the other two artists that I work with on this. We all came up with, with, with our own responses to isolation and what it means to be a restricted body at a time like this and still try to find a voice and respond to Bruce Nauman, which is an incredible artist that we all respect. So it's, it's quite a big privilege to be involved in this project with Tate. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, you said that uh, you were exploring what it means to be an isolated body during times like this. I know you've been working with uh, body, human body limits and possibilities of human body for, for a time now, but I wonder what you learned from the COVID-19 process about human body. Wow, so much. I obviously feel that over time in all of us, I see the tiredness now. That's definitely something that has come with COVID. We were maybe still tired from the speed of life, but right now the slowing down and the restriction is also showing me that we can get tired by being inactive. We can get tired by being alone. We can be tired by being isolated. It's almost like a lower frequency to be in. So I've definitely seen the effects of that, both in my work, in my therapy work, and in, in the art uh, that I make. So I've definitely observed that. And also how much we need human interaction. We really do need each other. We are a community and we are structured that way. So we need to find ways to reach out and touch each other again. Mm -hmm. And I wonder what you think, I mean, sort of uh, an extension of the question that I just asked, how you think the way we relate to our bodies has changed over uh, COVID-19 quarantines? Because, for example, as I was watching the video in the morning when you told me and uh, the audience, obviously, to touch our face and try to feel the wind uh, on our faces, I just was sort of irked by it because I was like, this is wrong that I touch my face. So I wonder how you think what kind of a legacy will this leave us with? Yeah, I think that, that you really picked up on something that was quite important for me because that section is really about how we are locked inside and the wind isn't with us in the city lives that we live in. But uh, we need to find new ways of connecting to nature. So that was one of the reasons why I wanted to bring that, the Imagine element of wind the into the performance face. and also the restrictions of, yeah, we're not allowed to touch our face, but in a context like this, 
I kind of wanted to push those boundaries and the space between us and the masks and what we're not allowed to do. And I kind of wanted to push through with that, asking you to touch your face and mm -hmm. feel that we actually are real human beings because it is very easy to feel mm -hmm. out of body when the body isn't walking, when the body isn't holding things, when the body isn't lifting things and in life actively. So it's also it a way of to redraw touching the body again and remembering the body again at a time where we are really asked to be restricted and a lot of boundaries are put on the way we live. So how do we push through and feel human, feel real, feel that there is, there's a, there's a flesh that we carry around and it's easy to forget that. Mm -hmm. So I try to make little points that could help people remember. These are really pertinent and interesting questions, but I, I assume that you ask these kind of questions because you're a psychotherapist in your sessions as well in adult mental health in schools. So I wonder how you differentiate your practice in terms of that. What considers um, art, performance art slash, I don't know, uh, movement? Uh, what is psychotherapy for you? Mm, another complicated question, <laughs> <laughs> but absolutely. I, I think they both feed each other. So clinic, when I work clinically, the boundaries are a lot more clear and there's a relationship that I build with the person that I'm in the room with. Although having said that, I do know that I'm there as, a, as clinically as a dance movement psychotherapist or as a creative therapist at times. Still, the essence of what we have and what we make sometimes can really feel like performance itself or can really feel like art. So it's not to say that art's not in that room when I'm working clinically, mm. but it's just how I position myself in the room I'm not existing as a, down, as a performance artist. I'm just there to support and guide the other person in the process of their making. Whereas I'm in my body as a performance artist only and I'm trying to express that, again, this time my psychotherapist self kind of comes through the cracks, but I'm there as an artist who doesn't see any limits, who is constantly re making the boundaries and it's just a state of being that is very it's almost not this world it's almost like i'm channeling something else it's my experience of performance art it's transformative for me so in therapy room where i feel like i'm actually the one that's giving therapy in the performance room i'm actually the one that's receiving it it's my healing for me oh very interesting okay we don't have much time left, so before we wrap up, I know uh, uh, there will be the premiere of a new film uh, at Tate, so tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so the workshop is live right now. You can go on Tate website and watch my 15-minute workshop. But on Thursday, our new film is coming out with Rowdy SS and Thomas Hayes, uh, curated by Annie Bicknell and Essa Onajero, supported by Terra Foundation. So on Thursday, if you come on Tate website, you'll see something that we've all made together in our own individual responses to Bruce Nauman and the times that we're in called Resilient Responses. All right, lovely. That's uh, the 4th of February, I guess, that Thursday. It was lovely having yes. you, Akin. Lovely. Thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Breakdancing is not popular in Afghanistan, and for conservative Afghans, it's not appropriate for women. But a young girl is making moves to change all of that. At a gym in downtown Kabul, Manisha Talash jumps and sways to the beat with her fellow breakdancers. But it wasn't until three months ago that she started b-girling, and after she joined the club, other girls followed. The club didn't have a female member when I first joined. I was very interested in breakdancing, and when I became aware that it's come to Afghanistan and its members are all nice people from my own country, I joined this club to introduce this profession to other people. It hasn't been an easy ride though, and it's not only because breakdancing is hard to master, she also has to fight against gender stereotypes. 
Ever since the Taliban regime was removed 20 years ago, women's rights have gradually improved, but they still face a lot of pressure. People often say negative things instead of positive ones. For example, they say we are Muslims and dancing in Afghanistan is a sin because it's an Islamic country. Some people have even threatened me and say, if we reach you, we'll cut you into pieces, but I still don't want to give up. And Talaj hopes that attitude will help her become a professional. She even aspires to represent her country in international breaking events. I think it's very good that women can do such a sport like breaking. We have four years to train more girls in Afghanistan and to introduce at least one or two of them as breakdancing athletes to the international community. Breaking, which was born in the United States, was initially a way for rival street gangs to fight for turf. For Talash, it's a fight to break the barriers in people's minds. The Royal Tenenbaums cemented Wes Anderson's reputation as an influential director. Since its release 20 years ago, many movies tried to copy its unique style and failed. I should sell it, yeah. Chaz Tenenbaum was a financial expert and started buying real estate in his early teens. Wes Anderson says the Royal Tenenbaums is a family story. Inspired by the works of J.D. Salinger and Orson Welles' The Magnificent Ambersons. Told as a bittersweet New York fairy tale. Yet, he went to great lengths to avoid filming the Big Apple's landmarks. Gene Hackman reportedly couldn't understand Anderson's quirky methods. For instance, a scene shot in front of the Statue of Liberty never showed the Statue of Liberty. The director argued he was making his own version of the city. He wanted to fill it in with imagined landmarks, like the Lindbergh Palace Hotel which plays home to the main character, Royal Tenenbaum. This fictional world is inhibited by both Hollywood royalty, like Hackman and Angelica Houston, and Hollywood's younger stars, like Luke Wilson and Gwyneth Paltrow. Critics at the time pointed out that the whole cast was at the top of their game, and Gene Hackman would eventually go on to win a Best Acting Golden Globe for his portrayal for the dysfunctional patriarch. Anderson's collaboration with his constant director of photography, Robert Yeoman, also reached a milestone with this film. The carefully composed visual framing, as well as the lavish colors, not only received high praise, but also inspired many photographers, filmmakers, and fashion designers to follow this aesthetic. As for the top-notch writing of the script, it landed Anderson and co-writer Owen Wilson a Best Original Screenplay Oscar nomination. The movie was being called the film of the year. Directors like Cameron Crowe praised its music and its memorable characters. And critics called it the most quintessential New York City movie since 1979's Manhattan. Wes Anderson once said he wanted the film to feel timeless. And watching it, you never know what time period you're in, even 20 years later. You probably don't even know my middle name. That's a trick question. You don't have one. Helen. Mm. We had to wait a whole year to see this new exhibition, but the artist says the wait was worth it. Nursena Tutar explains why. Spain's Museo Picasso Malaga has an extensive exhibition by the Spanish artist Miquel Barcelo. It's called Metamorphosis, after Franz Kafka's famous book. The overarching theme is Barcelo's passion for nature, told through ceramics, paintings, watercolours and an installation. At first, we decided on the title Metamorphosis, because I had worked in France and in Spain on Kafka's book, Metamorphosis. This was the name of the exhibition that later acquired another meaning with the COVID-19. 
metamorphosis and infection, transformation and all this. Just like these paintings of fish that stick their heads out of the water. Of course, during lockdown, they acquired another meaning, right? Because we all felt like trying to get our heads out of the water. Barcelo's artworks don't turn into huge insects. Instead, these misshapen and fragmented works are made out of a wide range of materials, such as seaweed, milk, eggs and blood. I find it interesting to think about the world in a way beyond the visible. And I don't only mean the spiritual world. I think the lockdown has been good for artists, because it gives you the space to work and the time, without the rush we have been living during the last 20 years. Although the death toll of COVID-19 in Spain is amounting to 60,000 people, the artist says ignorance is also a great pandemic right now. So, while art can't protect you from a deadly virus, it can add a little more wisdom into the world. When Daesh took over large swaths of Iraq, Radio Al Ghad was established as an independent voice. Now it's a social media enterprise with over a million followers. We have a look at its latest project, an online exhibition launched on Google Arts and Culture. The art and soul of Mosul recently went live on Google Arts and Culture. It's the second collaboration between Google and Radio Al Ghad a community organization focusing on the revival of Mosul. The message uh, behind the exhibition is about showing life for a city that witnessed uh, a very abnormal period of time uh, in the modern history. And, show, and sharing these messages will, with all the world through international platforms such as Google Arts and Culture um, is going to help to deliver Mosul's message and, uh, in the eyes of artists. And this is uh, why we have tried to build upon the, the online exhibition. 39 artists from Iraq and the rest of the Arab world reflect on the occupation of Mosul under Daesh. Hakam Al-Khatib is one of them. He joined the project after the terrorist forces raided his home. They entered my home and burnt all my archive most of my paintings and sculptures. Luckily, I had hidden some of the paintings in the attic. One day, Muhammad from Radio Al Ghad contacted me and told me about this project. While Al Hashimi and the rest of the group contributed their artistic talents, Google made sure the show had a clear message. If you want to really get cut through online, you know, you have to provide a narrative, you have to provide a story and you have to have these kind of, you know, experiences that people are looking for. One of, for example, one of my favorite parts of the project, apart from the artists and what they have come up with, which is absolutely stunning, is also the uh, 3D reconstruction of some of the minarets and uh, some of the uh, historical locations. The role Google Arts and Culture played in the show's curation was sticking to what they do the best the tech of it all. They helped artists develop new narratives and digital storytelling formats that would attract diverse audiences. But the way we were involved in the curation was not so much of trying to tell them to, you know, here is what you need to say, but more about trying to come up with technology formats that they can use. So for example, one of the things we did is they have these amazing artworks but how do you get really close and how do you get really zooming into these artworks so we use our technology? Such as this 360 degree narrated tour of Mosul's heritage sites. Some of these landmarks were destroyed during the Daesh occupation and now only exist in street view. The city of Mosul, in reality, 
and the artists from Musul are far from the limelight. So the Google platform helps us exhibit the works of artists from Musul. It helps a lot to spread at an international level. Google first worked with Radio Algod a few years back at the recently restored Mosul Museum. That building had once been destroyed by Daesh. Iraq continues to be a hotbed of unrest, but this time around, the art has safely secured a permanent home online. The coronavirus crisis has forced many museums and art galleries to close their doors. But one New York tech company has found a way for people to personally explore the masterpieces in the city's largest art museum. I'm really excited to announce an incredible immersive art experience. The creators of the Met Unframed are calling the project a masterpiece of digital inclusivity. The 50 works in the Metropolitan Museum of Art's collection from never-before-seen galleries are available on mobile devices so people everywhere can experience art, even if they're on another continent. In collaboration with U.S. telecommunications firm Verizon, the Met Unframed is a demonstration of the potential of next-generation 5G connectivity in an online environment. The immersive virtual art and gaming experience with enhancements is entirely powered by Verizon's 5G Ultra Wideband. Thanks to AR made possible by one of the currencies of 5G, extremely high bandwidth. Students and educators from across the country can explore objects like the Apollo 11 command module you see here. Vestig also says that the global pandemic has fast-tracked innovations in the online sphere. This mass shift sped up the timeline for work from home, distant learning and telemedicine. We knew it was coming, but it was closer than we realized. Now, instead of being our future, it's our present high-fidelity 3D scans of objects. So while 5G networks promise higher speeds and greater connectivity, they also hold the promise of keeping us connected to an expansive global platform for the arts in a time of crisis. Even after closing their doors again to prevent a second wave of COVID-19, museums across Italy are still keeping busy and one in Rome in particular is using this downtime to pay special attention to some of its most precious treasures. How is it possible that an oil painting from the 17th century could be made to look even more divine? That's a question for the restorers at the Palazzo Barberini National Museum of Ancient Art in Rome, because it's their job to make that happen. One way is by carefully wiping away dirt and grime from the artworks to unearth the vibrant colours originally used by the artist, or by repairing a crack in the elaborate gold-covered frame of a painting from the 15th century. Focusing on repairing the smallest details of these artworks is no small task, and doing so during a pandemic makes it even more challenging. Actually, we're facing more complications because we ourselves are affected by the restrictions due to COVID-19, so there are fewer of us here. We try to keep working at a normal pace, so we'll be ready when the museum reopens to the public. The absence of paying visitors has dealt a major financial blow to the museum. Last year, their ticket sales fell from 1 million to just 500,000 euros. Walking through a completely empty museum gives you a feeling of melancholy. Because we're here for the public. Museums exist because there is a public. And without a public, they don't make sense. At the same time, for us it's a time for great activity, great productivity. We've done a lot of restorations, we've made acquisitions, we've fixed up the presentation of the permanent collection. While it might be heartbreaking to see works by great artists like Raphael and Caravaggio hanging on the walls with no one to appreciate them, it's comforting to know they'll be looking their best 
when the museum doors do eventually reopen. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Ilf Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.